Before we start the show this week, we wanted to take a quick second to tell you about a new initiative we're introducing in the podcast, which is our Talking Cars donation program. For those that don't know, CR is a nonprofit, and we're able to do all of the work we do, including anonymously buying our test cars and producing this show through memberships to our website and magazine, as well as through donations. What the Talking Cars donation program will do is allow loyal Talking Cars fans to show support for the podcast, assist in supporting the costs of producing the podcast, as well as support all the work CR does to keep consumers safe. You'll be able to contribute either as a one-time donation or on a monthly basis. Even $5 a month really helps. Go to CR.org slash give talking cars to find out more. In any event, we'll keep delivering talking cars each and every week. Again, go to CR.org slash give talking cars to find out more. Thanks for watching and enjoy the show. We talk about our final test results of the 2020 Range Rover Evoque. We discuss the highly anticipated launch of the Ford Bronco, and we answer audience questions, including how do you break into the automotive journalism world? Next on Talking Cars. Hi, and welcome back to Talking Cars. I'm Jennifer Stockberger. I'm Keith Barry. And I'm John Lincove. So we're going to start out this week with the big news of the week, the highly anticipated, highly teased launch of the new Ford Bronco. So if you've watched any television this week, you've seen it everywhere, endorsed by celebrities on all different shows. Super, super big deal for Ford. So let me just rattle off a few specs here. The first out will be what Ford's terming a subcompact Bronco Sport, smaller version. Base engine is 181 horsepower, 1.5 liter liter turbocharged three-cylinder engine. Um, Optional is a 245 two-liter turbocharged four. Eight-speed automatic, eight inches of ground clearance. They're talking a lot about pricing estimated between 26 and 36. Um, 2021 model year out later this year availability. It will be followed by a larger mid-sized Bronco, two and four-door versions. Base engines there are a 270 horsepower, 2.3 liter turbocharged four, an optional 310 horsepower, 2.7 liter twin turbo V6. All four of those powertrains have the EcoBoost name on them. really seem to be honing in on some off-road capability, removable doors, the ground clearance, all of these things, 3,500 pounds max towing capacity, good things, the Ford Copilot 360 suite of standard safety features, which we love, um, will be standard. Um, Many, many unique trims, including names like Big Bend and Black Diamond, Outer Banks, Badlands, even a Sasquatch option package. You you can't uh, actually see that one. Right. You can't see that. (laughs) Yeah. No one will ever see it. (laughs) So it's so, you know, they're absolutely just by the names alone appealing to the outdoorsy element. But John, go back with the history of the Bronco. Why is this such a giant, giant introduction for Ford? You know, it's 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 one of those epic cars, vehicles from from the history, and and it's one of the vehicles like the Wrangler. It started out kind of from a you know military uh, desire background. You know, Jeep was uh, you know a military vehicle, and Ford was doing research back then, seeing that people were buying surplus Jeeps. Um, you know, they wanted. They wanted to build something that had that kind of rugged go everywhereness, but not as crude. Came up with the Bronco, which which you know was a sports utility vehicle, uh, you know, of, of the era back in the '60s. Um, it it it's one of those things where it's agricultural or workhorse at best to start. So you're looking at first generation, you know, very small wheelbase. So between the wheels, very short, two door. You could take the roof off all fully. You could make it a small little, you know cab with a with a back um you know pickup truck bed almost you know with, with the seat back there uh you could fold the windshield down you know they they had uh it, it was kind of a rough and ready vehicle 
We tested a 1972 version along with a Chevrolet Blazer, the International Scout 2. There's a name we don't see anymore. Uh, a Jeep Commando, Toyota Land Cruiser. You know, so some vehicles that, you know, manufacturers have kept over these decades. You know, you're talking 40, 50 years of history. Um, you know, and, and, and they became much more comfortable over time. But even when they got into the 70s, they were still truck-based vehicles. They were still based on pickup trucks. They had, uh, you know, uh, for a while, kept the uniqueness of being able to take the cap off the back. Um, so you almost had a, had open air. So again, if you look at people, even the more modern Toyota 4Runners, you know, of, of the uh, 90s and early 2000s, you could take the cap off the back. Um, so you could have an open air experience, but still had, you know, a roof and, and you know, almost a roll cage protection area above you. Um, I mean, I we owned a Bronco too, as my fa- and my family did. Um, and it was Again, an early SUV. They were not common out there. The the big ones were much more common than the small ones. Um, and we used it as, as really the modern station wagon driving all around the you know the the northeast and even into the Midwest in it. And and they were fun. And they had split folding seats. And they offered a, a lot of things that cars didn't, particularly the all wheel drive or the four wheel drive of the era, ability to go anywhere in all kinds of weather. Yeah, my husband absolutely had a 73 Bronco as his daily driver and says probably monthly, oh, gosh, I wish I still had that car. Hmm. So he was very excited to see the launch. He thought it looked great. Um, It's one thing that struck me was that those old classics, you know, I've talked about I have a 67 Mustang out in the garage. They were hard to drive. I remember that Bronco had more steering play. You could do this and the tires didn't do anything. So to bring those names back in a modern configuration is kind of cool. Keith, any nostalgia or or excitement about the new Bronco? Yeah, so I, I think the most interesting thing is is uh, that it, it isn't a nostalgia play. Because when I first heard about this, I was thinking, uh, you know, I, for people who, who got their driver's licenses after the Bronco stopped being kind of an off-roader, and then the Explorer came out and that changed everything. And then people realized you don't need a, you don't need a truck to, to get all the, the, the benefits of, of an SUV. So I think for people my age who are just a, just a little bit younger than than both of you, the Bronco, the the Grand Wagoneer, those 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 didn't have that that off road uh, that off road idea. But this is a different car. This is something that is going to attract people regardless of the name. They could have called it anything. And all I've seen is just universal acclaim and excitement for this. Uh, you see young people, older people, a bunch of automotive journalists are, are putting their own money down and uh, for a deposit for one of these things. So that's really cool. Uh, so I think by moving away from nostalgia and not just, you know, slapping a nostalgic name on something, <clears throat> Blazer, um, <laughs> you know, building something that people want, I think that this will transcend that. So the people who remember their 73 Bronco and the people who, you know, might might not want a Wrangler, but the Escape is a little too, you know, soft in terms of looks are also going to really go after this after this vehicle. Yeah, so so obviously it's draw, it's drawn so much excitement. They did such a good job, I thought, of coordinating the launch, be it social media, television. It'll be so cool to see if people like you, Keith, who are, you've now said, very much younger than us, have the same, <laughs> like it as much as those of us who have nostalgia around it. So very, very cool. Of course, um, Ford is taking deposits on the new Bronco. We, Consumer Reports, have a deposit. Obviously, we buy everything anonymously, so those deposits are with an individual, not as Consumer Reports. So we will be getting both the Bronco and the Bronco Sport when they are available. So moving on to cars we already have and have tested, um, we have our final test results in of the 2020 Land Rover Range Rover Evoque. Um, just rattling off some more specs again. This is a 246 horsepower, two liter, four cylinder turbo. Um, pricing ranges from 42.6 to 56.8. With ours, we did add a drive package that added blind spot assist and some other safety, um, a cold weather pack, which gave us heated and power, heated rear front and rear seats, power sunroof. Ours came in at $56,997. Um, so, and that's an SE trim. So any thoughts, Keith, on your final impressions of the Land Rover Range Rover Evoque? Yeah. Um, uh, this- <laughs> 
<laughs> this is this is not this is not a special car. You know, kind of kind of going from the Bronco to this, and 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 the sad thing about it is that when the first Evoque debuted, it was. Oh my God! Land Rover was 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 taking a concept car and and selling it to people. They had the crazy convertible version. They had the two door version, and then they came out with the new one, and it looked exactly the same. This should have been sort of a limited edition car. And when the Evoque first came out, there weren't that many luxury small SUVs. Now there are a ton, and all the other ones out there are are pretty much better than this. I mean, this this was sort of the worst of every possible world in terms of the fuel economy of a much bigger SUV, uh, slow, uh, you know, it, it doesn't handle great. There's nothing that's really sporty about it. The looks are no longer something that are going to attract attention, and it's it's really expensive. Ugh, you know, uh, that's that, that. Those are my thoughts. Sorry, <laughs> tell us how you really feel. I do still think that the styling does draw some reactions. You know, I had a neighbor um, who was like, "Yeah, thumbs up." So I do think it still does that, and I think that's its major appeal. Um, John, mm. anything to add to what Keith said about the range? Oh of gosh, Keith, Keith hit a lot of it. Um, <laughs> I mean, one of the key things that I find is from their advertising, where they have a, a very hip cult, uh, couple in yeah. New York City, like. Soho area, and they're they're bringing a big box out of a out of a store, and they're putting it in the back of their Land Rover, Range Rover, Evoque, and then they realize they can't see out the back window, so they they press a button, and now they have this, you know, the mirror that's a digital mirror, electric mirror from the outside. So the car is so sloped, the rear is so sloped that this kind of normal box. I mean, it wasn't like they had a ninety inch flat screen TV. I mean, it's a yeah, you couldn't fit that box. in anyways. Uh, yeah. Well, right. <laughs> You know, so they put this box in. Now all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we can't see. But if you had a Toyota Rav Four, you'd actually be able to fit the box and see out. So you know, here's this utterly compromised vehicle that makes things a challenge. Yeah, it looks great. But also, I was quarantined into that car. I had traveled out of the state on a plane, came back. I had to spend 14 days at home. Uh, couldn't go into work or couldn't do anything. And um, and after the quarantine, I drove it up to New Hampshire. And my my brother in law had never seen one. And he's like, "This is a wicked awesome car. I can't wait to to go for a ride. Let let's go out in it." And then he noticed how loud it was and how small it was and how, you know, the ride wasn't great and how it, you know, had turbo lag where it would delay and then launch forward. And then I told him it was 57 grand and he just was blown away about how it didn't do half the things that his Toyota Tacoma could do better for far less. And that's kind of the way it is. It's just, it's, it's, it's like a bauble. It's really nice and shiny and pretty, but it doesn't really do anything. There are so many other, even more, you know, even expensive luxury compact SUVs, you know, the X1, X2, or the Audi Q3, or at that price, you could even get an Audi Q5 or a BMW X3. That, that Macan. Do it much better. Porsche Macan. That do it much better. It's funny you, you compare it to the Tacoma being much better because we don't typically say the Tacoma is a great on-road vehicle, you know, in terms of ride and everything, and you're saying it's better. He Two, enjoyed it more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Two things strike me about the Evoque. One is I've kind of gotten used to the slopey rear windows of many, many SUVs. As long as I feel I'm open in the front, rear view cameras help, et cetera, with merging and backing up. But that car feels very closed in, even in the front. Uh, the squatty side windows, even the cowl of the dash, you know, as a big hump right in front of the driver. I just feel like I'm completely closed in. Um, kids in the rear seats, those windows are very, very squatty. Um, and that belt line is very, very high. Um, not a great place, I don't think, for um, happy kids. Comfortable enough, safe enough, but not very happy. And the other thing was the ride. I'm I'm usually a proponent of getting a bit firmer ride, a little more response. This was pretty stiff ride. Every joint, you know, on the highway was not just a slap and not just a da -da 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 noise, but feeling of, of every kind of micro disturbance even. So anyway, so as you can tell, a lot of our kind of impressions, the strongest impressions of the Evoque are about the livability of the car. But of course, we have full test results. If you're interested in all the numbers and details, see them at consumerreports.org. So moving on to your questions, as always, we love them. Talking cars at iCloud.com, 30 second video clips, written questions. We actually have two video questions this week. The first is from Malik from Mississippi. Hey, Consumer Reports. I currently drive a 2017 Hyundai Elantra, and in the last couple months, a lot of stuff has changed. 
I recently graduated college. I've moved and I actually started working like an hour away. And I've realized now my launcher is not really conducive to my lifestyle. The launcher is simply too small. So I'm looking at getting either a bigger sedan, uh, SUV, or a truck. I'm from Mississippi. I mean, we all drive trucks and stuff here. So I'm really, really familiar with it. But what are some recommendations that you have for me? My price range is around thirty-five to forty thousand dollars. Thanks. So first of all, Malik, congratulations on your graduation. You will forever be the graduating class of 2020 and your new job and moving. So let me go to Keith. Any good options you found for Malik for replacing his Elantra? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I know we mentioned a truck, but also an SUV. And I think maybe there's something kind of in between there. There's a car that's that's kind of caught my eye. Uh, and, and it's the, uh, the Kia Seltos. It's, it's an SUV. Uh, it's, it's a crossover SUV, but it's got that kind of rugged look to it. Uh, it is not going to be, it kind of splits the difference between the Elantra and a truck. I, I like this a lot. Um, our full test results are, are online if you want to, uh, want to check that out, but it's, it's a brand new vehicle. Um, it's, it's got the all wheel drive, it's got the space, um, but it isn't sort of hulking and big, and it doesn't really have those compromises that you might have with say like a full size truck. Uh, you would be able to get one really well equipped in your price range as well too. So that's my recommendation. So good luck. I spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of time in that Seltos and I also like it. John, any options for Malik? Yeah, there's, there's always the Hyundai Elantra GT. So it gives you the hatchback option uh, of, of a, a similar car, you know, a car you're familiar with. So still small, efficient car, um, not a subcompact, not tiny. But also, just because you have a budget up to $30,000 does not necessarily mean spend $30,000. So a couple options you could look at and uh, looking through some of the used car content on ConsumerReports.org. 2017 to 2018 Hyundai Santa Fe. Uh, 2018 Hyundai Santa Fe Sport. So you're getting a vehicle that's depreciated. Used car prices are much, much stronger right now because of, of, uh, of, of just the economy, just because of COVID, just because of, of people having, there's a lot of inventory of new cars, people holding on to their cars, used cars, they're, they're, they're just not as many available, but still you can find those in the 20 to $25,000 range. So those are a couple of good options, the new or the used, I think. Yeah. No, that's great. Great. I, I kind of stuck with the truck um, and my advice for Malik You was, did what he asked. You followed yes, the instructions. I did, I did. Well, he didn't say just, he said SUV. You guys are both there. But um, I said Honda Ridgeline. Um, it, it's actually the truck I tried to get my husband to buy recently when we made a truck purchase and he did not do it. Um, but great on-road manners. I'm listening to Malik saying he might be moving again. So he gets the utility of the truck plus comfortable passengers that in in bed trunk um i think is a great um um utility and for in terms of everyday driving if something needs to go in there so that was my vote for malik and right in his price range albeit new um so um those were our advice so hopefully malik we've given you some some cars to consider as you replace your elantra so our next video question is from patrick in raleigh north carolina Let's see what he needs help with. Hi, Talking Cars. I have a question about wireless Apple CarPlay, and that is, is it possible or even probable for automakers to update the infotainment systems in existing cars to be able to support this feature? Uh, I have a 2018 Honda Accord Touring, and it has all the system requirements near as I can tell, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, location services. And so I don't see any technical reason why this isn't possible. But if you could let me know whether you think this is something that could happen, that'd be great. Thanks. Bye. So we've had similar questions on the upgradeability, if you will, of CarPlay and Android Auto. And Keith, I know you have some experience in this area. So I'm going to throw this one to you. 
Yeah, so Patrick, the good news is that your car already has CarPlay built in. So for those of you out there who are watching this and think, I want wireless CarPlay, but my car doesn't have CarPlay, period. Well, you're kind of out of luck uh, in almost every case, unless you've got a very select number of vehicles which can be upgraded. As far as the actual uh, wireless, um, in general, generally speaking, it, it's more than just a software upgrade. It's, it's usually hardware involved as well, because it is a Wi-Fi connection uh, for CarPlay to take place. And that has to be a dedicated separate Wi-Fi connection that your your phone can always be on when it's on the car because it's just it's just so much data that needs to be transferred so fast that Bluetooth just isn't going to cut it. Um, there are some aftermarket uh, solutions out there that will basically, it's kind of like a little box that you plug into your uh, USB port where you would normally plug in your CarPlay uh, USB cord. Uh, and these cost about like 120 bucks. There are a bunch of them out there. There are a bunch of sort of user reviews. We haven't tested them. Uh, but in general, the the sort of consensus is positive that there's a little bit of lagginess, but it does, it does allow you you to keep your phone in your pocket. A couple of things to keep in mind in terms of whether or not you would want this. It's going to drain your battery and many newer cars that already have wireless CarPlay built in also have a wireless charging mat built in. So you, you have to take your phone out of your pocket anyways and put your, you know, put your phone in a certain part of the car. Otherwise, you're going to get out of your car and your phone might be, you know, 20 percent battery or dead, depending upon what it was when you got in the car. The other issue is that we found with people who have wireless CarPlay in vehicles, um, we've, we've heard this from our, our members and we've experienced this ourselves, uh, that sometimes the handoff when you first get in the car that it isn't seamless. Uh, and that's particularly the case in BMWs we've driven. Uh, I found, you know, if you park close enough to your house where your, your, your phone is on your home Wi-Fi and then you get into the car, it can sometimes the phone is like, where am I? Am I in the car? Am I at the house? What should I connect to? And your, and your car play doesn't work until you're, you know, half a mile down the road. And when it doesn't work, you, you know, what do you, you pull over, you restart the car, you restart your phone. It's not as easy as just plugging it in. It, it seems like it might be easier, but the way that the technology is right now, and remember this is all brand new and there are software updates and hardware updates coming. It might not be, you know, for 120 bucks, if you, if, if to you that is something which is, hey, I'll try it out money, try one of these and see what happens. But be prepared that it might be a little more finicky. Yeah. So, so good things for Patrick to consider whether he even wants wireless CarPlay <laughs> at this point, but, but certainly some options for him. So um, thank you very much, Patrick. So moving on to some written questions, we have, from, have one from Jenny in Virginia, and she says, I live in a townhouse community with no electric car charging stations and no plans to install them in the foreseeable future. How practical is it to buy a car such as the new Toyota RAV4 Prime? I should also say that we do not have garages. So Keith, this sounds actually kind of similar to your living situation. So um, what would you say to Jenny? Yeah, currently I'm in, I'm in a similar situation. And, <laughs> you know, the RAV4 Prime is, is an interesting choice because it's a plug-in hybrid. Uh, and that means that if you plug it in, you, you have an electric car for a few miles. But if you don't plug it in, you have a hybrid. So it's not, you're never going to be left stranded. Um, the issue is that <clears throat> you're going to have to check with your individual townhouse community. I have a funny feeling they're going to say no. We're just going to assume that, that you're not going to be able to charge it at home. So the thing you have to realize is that some plug-in hybrids are better as hybrids than as not. And John, I know you've been doing some research uh, into, into this where this might be, this might be a different calculus, right? It, it might be. They're, they're not cheap. Hmm. I mean, they're, they're, you're looking at some that are with, with, with the, there's the XSE packages that there's only two versions available with the option packages. You're looking at 46 to $50,000 SUVs. And that's before the, the price gouging, I've seen dealers adding $5,000 on, onto the car just as a market adjustment. And their justification was, well, there's only, we're only getting one and it's a very hot car. Um, I, I would say that if you can get the charger, fantastic. At that point, if you can't, 
and you're going to be paying MSRP or more at that point, it really, it's a RAV4. I, I would go for a RAV4 hybrid. It's a, it's been selling extremely well, actually, uh, better than the regular RAV4. Um, it, it's not quite a, a great vehicle in that they made a hybrid and made it even better. Uh, that, that's probably the sweet spot of this, of this equation right now. If you're looking at a RAV4 and you're looking at an EV-ish RAV4. Yeah, that, that was my sentiment is just go with the hybrid. And don't get us wrong. There's other prime type, you know, you think of the Prius prime that don't have such a big differential between the, the regular hybrid and the, the plug-in hybrid. There's other cars that maybe that price difference isn't so big if it's still something you're interested in. So great question from Jenny. So moving on, we have an additional question from Daniel. Thanks for keeping the show going through these crazy times. They are crazy. And thank you, Daniel. My dream job has always been automotive journalist. I love driving and writing about cars. I have uploaded three videos of my family's cars, and I'm wondering where to go from here. Do I just call up dealers and ask if they would allow someone to make a review for some free advertising? From what you know, is that a typical way of getting started? So, Daniel, we just happen to have two automotive journalists right here. So I'm going to start with you, Keith. Thoughts for Daniel on career moves? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I've been doing this for a little over a decade, and I can tell you that it's entirely different world than when even I started. That nowadays, uh, with YouTube, uh, you know, people can can basically get into this on the ground floor without having to go through. It is, and it it, it is, and it was a, a bit of an old boys club uh, in terms of of the automotive journalism world. The nice thing is that there are a lot of people out there now who can have a different perspective on. things things who can do that on their own. So my advice to you would be to find a perspective out there that nobody else has. And whether it's on a particular part of the inside of the car or a particular brand of vehicle or, um, you know, just something, you know, something that you have that, that makes you different than everyone else out there. Because again, almost anyone can, can go online and, and talk about cars. Most of the people who I know who are not who write about cars don't do it full time. They have another job. Um, but it, once you've, you've already taken the first step, you've uploaded three videos. Um, wherever you are, there is probably a, an automotive press group, um, a local group that you might be able to join. Uh, and hopefully they're not too closed off. Some of them are a little, ooh, your competition, we don't want you here. Uh, but some of them are a lot more open and you'll definitely find someone who within that group who can kind of steer you in the right direction. But there is there is formal education yeah. as well, right? Yeah. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I mean, certainly that app. <laughs> yeah, I mean my right. my I mean I have a journalism background from from college, uh, a public right. health background from from grad school, which is sort of how I got into the world of safety. Also, uh, honestly, a, a ton of luck and connections. Yes. I'm not going to say I'm some super genius uh, here. Uh, it's a, a lot of a lot of it in the world is it is that. But again, for something like safety, the public health background certainly helps a lot. John, anything to add for for um, Daniel? You could totally go the traditional route and go to school, have a, a you know a journalism or a broadcast journalism uh, degree. I have a broadcast journalism degree and translated into working for Consumer Reports eight, <clears throat> eighteen years ago. Um, I also freelanced before that, and I think that's kind of the thing is you find your niche. I didn't go. Uh, to become an auto journalist by doing everything. I went and, and found a thing about Audis. I was very into Audis. I wrote for a club magazine for free and a website for free and, and con- contributed where I could and then finally got, you know, small payments. Um, but be an expert in something. I think that's the key thing now. And whether it's interior car tech, safety technology, you know, ADAS, the advanced driving, uh, uh, advanced driver assist systems or, or whatever it is. Own that, be the expert there, because that gives people a reason to come to you. Because you know what? No offense, Daniel. You know, an excited guy who wants to do this, there may be 50 other excited guys who want to do the same thing in the 50 surrounding towns. And why is a dealer going to give any of you a car? Because it's it's an asset that they don't want to have damaged. They want to know what they're going to get out of it. And that's that's legit. So find something that you could do that's not going to rely on, on being given that. Uh, borrow, rent, but focus on that, make a presence online, make a presence on YouTube, make a presence on Twitter. And, and like Keith said, um, and and that will give people reason to actually support you and help you advance your career. Well, 
that was great insight. I was fascinated actually to learn a little bit about how you guys got where you got. So that was very, very cool. And the good thing is that cars have enough going on other than getting us from point A to point B where you can be expert in a number of areas. So thank you, Daniel. Thank everybody for your questions. Again, talking cars at iCloud.com. That will do it for this episode. If you're looking for additional information on anything we talked about, see the show notes. Keep watching, keep listening, and we'll see you next time.